Randall Wallace. Welcome to the show. Great to be with you, Brad. So you are a screenwriter, producer, director, songwriter, who's worked on a lot of touchstone films in American cinema. And the one I think a lot of men particularly uh, know you about and was sort of your breakthrough was Braveheart. And we're coming up on the 20th anniversary of it. I guess it is the 20th anniversary, which is crazy. It makes me feel kind of old. Um, <laughs> I remember when it came out. Um, and you got to... Yeah, I think it makes me feel... <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe it's 20 years either. Yeah, it's nuts. Um, but y along with this, you, you come out with a book called Living the Brave Heart Life, which is uh, a really great book. It's part memoir, part uh, you know insights on being an artist, part insights into life. And what I loved about it, it seemed like the book Living the Brave Heart Life was really the story of how writing Braveheart, Braveheart helped you write the story of your own life. Exactly. Um, so I'm curious, let's, let's talk about that. I mean, what was your life like before Braveheart and where did the inspiration come to write Braveheart? Because what I understand the, the story of William Wallace, there really isn't that much historic history about him. We know a little like fragments about him, but you were able to develop this really enriching story about him and Robert the Bruce. The, the literal history of William Wallace is, uh, known almost not at all, um, Winston Churchill, in his series of books called A History of the English-Speaking Peoples, mentions William Wallace and says that almost nothing is known about him in terms of literal historical fact, but his legends have inspired the Scottish people for centuries. Um, that's the way I came across the story. I was looking for my own family heritage, um, my wife was pregnant with our first son, and she knew her her lineage uh, back on all sides to many generations because she has Mormon ancestors. And um, so because she knew hers, I wanted to have some balance and know mine and uh, was looking for my roots in uh, Scotland and came across the statue of William Wallace. And and the fact that very little was known about him. Um, but on a deeper level, uh, to go back to your question, my life before Braveheart um, was, in my view, really rich. Um, I grew up in the South. I grew up in a really um, staunch Protestant family, tent revivals, um, church all the time. In, in some ways, that uh, sounds like torture to people. In some ways, it was. But I was exposed to the greatest literature, uh, the most magnificent music, orators who could hold an audience for hours on end. And, um, and you know, of course, far more important than that, I was exposed to, to Christianity and, and the, the story of Jesus of Nazareth. And... That was always important to me. Um, I, I wanted to live my life for some purpose greater than my own appetites. And, um, and I was inspired by, by the story of Jesus more than any other. Um, but I was talking with my family pastor who asked me if I felt the call to be a minister. And I said, I don't though I know it's the greatest calling anyone could have. And he said, you're wrong. The greatest calling you could have is the one God has for you. And um, that was as if I had been knighted, Brett. It was um, feeling that someone had released me to do everything I wanted to do in life or to try whatever I wanted to try. And I... Um, I was really successful at school. I went to Duke University. I majored in religion and had minor studies in Russian and creative writing. I, I had a time when I wanted to join the Marine Corps and their platoon leader corps, and then the Malai Massacre happened. And um, I, I, I saw that war as being in a stage that was not something I wanted to go be a part of. Um, but I really admired the people who had put their lives on the line for their country. I struggled with being a songwriter, um, came to Los Angeles. Um, 
I got into television writing and had a lot of success there, uh, then had some dark moments, and it was in those dark moments that I came to write Braveheart. The, the answer to why I feel that, this, that writing Braveheart was in some ways writing my own life is that the whole situation of my life boiled up into the story of Braveheart. Um, a man who has to stand on a battlefield and say, I will live or die right here. And living doesn't necessarily mean that my body survives this battle, but I will really live. And that's where every man dies, not every man really lives, came from. And it's where the, the whole trajectory of my life, I believe, was set in the decision to write what I wanted to see and stories that I wanted to hear myself and the kind of stories I wanted to tell my own sons and not what I thought Hollywood wanted me to be or Hollywood wanted to buy. It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, so, I mean, when you were saying that, that line, you know, every man dies but not every man lives, I mean, I get chills, you know, every time I hear it. Um, it's just so evocative. And what I, I love about Braveheart, and I think why it resonates with so many people, and particularly men, um, is because it hits on, it's, it, there's gore, there's battles, there's violence, there's that, but it hits on these really, these deep, visceral ideas that just get you to the bone. Um, and you talk about this in the Braveheart life. And so, for example, you talk about how both Braveheart and living a Braveheart life is, is a story or it's about fathers and sons and the relationship. And in your book, you talk a lot about how your own father and his role in shaping you as a man. Can you tell us a little bit about your dad and how he helped you become the man you are today? Yeah, that's, uh, that's in some ways the richest question in life. And Red, I love that you use the word visceral. Um, we, we somehow want to make a separation between our minds and our bodies and our spirits. Um, the word soul to some people means soul, like soul music is, is powerful and down to our core. But other people use it as if there's some disembodied um, thing, this, this ghosty mist that's somehow our being. My father connected me to life and um, in the way we relate to our fathers, I think is the as profound a relationship as we ever have. It's a part of the way we, we relate to our sons, the way we relate to our wives, or our daughters, our friends, um, and the way we relate to ourselves. Our, our dads give us um, our first taste of our own identity, especially as men. What does it mean to be a man? We look to our fathers. And my father was really different from me um, on paper. And if you, you looked at us, we seemed so different. My father uh, was a much more compact man than I am. Um, I'm sort of long and slender and my father was was much shorter. He was, I, I loved every sport there was. If it was a ball or a bat or involved running into each other or punching something, I wanted to do it. My father saw absolutely no use in running up and down a field. He couldn't see how that made money. And my dad's whole life was about um, how to survive because he was a child of the Depression and of World War II. Uh, in my, my parents' generation, the worst sins a person could commit were laziness and cowardice. And that was understandable since they, economic survival was so vital to them being children of the Depression. Um, and, and my father, at 14 years old, went to work full time I was very smart, but he had no one to encourage him to go to college. And um, his own father 
had died before he was born. So my father would, would take my sister and me when we were very young to a graveyard and we would stare at a, um, a monument, uh, a granite monument that said Wallace on it. And my father would say, this is my father. Um, and we, we never met him. We had not really even seen pictures of him. So um, it was in some ways mysterious to us why our father would want us to look at that, that stone. In some ways, I think it's because he, he was trying to, to wrap his own mind around who his father was. And the idea that this man who didn't have a father of his own, not a father who was breathing when he took his first breath, should become the greatest of fathers, a, a caring. I, I once said to somebody, um, my father may not have been a perfect man, but you couldn't prove that by me. In my mind, he was because he never raised his voice to us. He never raised his voice to my mother. He never struck her. He never drank. He never embarrassed us. We we're always proud of our father. Um, he was a salesman. And I, I have always felt if he were alive today and we were to send him to Afghanistan or Iraq, those people would become our friends because he would, <laughs> he would go find something to like about them. And he would, and he would show that to the world and to himself. He would see any person and, and recognize their, their value. Um, one of the most moving things, my father died at the end of, of uh, our making of We Were Soldiers. And the last time I saw him, he was uh, on the set of our movie. The last time I saw him uh, before he went into the hospital and got sick. And, um, uh, and when he passed away, I wrote the lyrics to the hymn, Mansions of the Lord, about my father. And um, when I was back working on the, the post-production of the movie, um, one of the Vietnamese guys who worked on the movie came out. I tell the story in the book. He came up to me and, and in this broken English, he said, Mr. Randy, I, I'm so sad about your father. And I said, thank you very much. And he said, I spoke with your father. And I said, yeah, thank you. Let's get back to work. Because I didn't want to get emotional again. It was only like a week after my father's funeral. And um, this young man said, no, you listen to me. And I stopped and he said, your father asked me, where is your father? And I said, my father died in Vietnam. And your father said to me, then I'll be your father. Um, complete stranger. Um, it you know, it moves me now. It, it, I, I can barely tell the story. Um, and I'm quick to add that I, I told this guy very fast, listen, if you think that makes you an heir and you're going to get any inheritance, you can give that up. You're not, <laughs> you're not getting any money. But, uh, uh, but that was the way my father was. And um, he didn't want me to be a writer. Um, he wanted me to do something secure as every father wants to see their sons be safe. And yet he was proud of me for going out into the battlefield of um, Hollywood and no one was more proud of Braveheart or anything else I did than my father. And one thing about fathers, and I think a lot of men have experienced this and women too with their parents is that you think they're superheroes, right? That they're invincible. Yes. And, but then there's always that moment something happens in their life and you see the chink in the armor for the first time and you see that they're vulnerable and that they're, they're not super superheroes. Um, and you had that experience with your dad. And can you talk a little bit about that and how that, even though it was, it was his darkest moment, how that, how you became stronger, how you became stronger from it. That's the, been in many ways, the great mystery of my life and, and it's something that I refer to in the book as the wound um, that I realized, as you, as you say, my father was wounded under his armor and he was bleeding there and, and maybe had always been, in part because he didn't 
have a father of its own, in part because of what the loss of her young husband had done to my grandmother and the way she had been to raise him. But when my father, who had had a really meteoric rise in business in the 1950s, he had gone from um, being a uh, an apprentice salesman trainee in a national candy company to being a, a divisional sales manager. He was head of several states, um, the salesman in the, all those states. Um, and then, um, and, he, and he had a swagger and he had a confidence. He, he was never overconfident. It, we, um, he lived really frugally, uh, far below our means, uh, as I would come to find out later. But um, he, he was, the, the company was sold to a bunch of uh, MBAs who believed the way to increase profits was to fire all the old guys that were making high salaries. And he was one of the old guys at 38. And they fired him. And the idea that anybody would fire my father it just broke him. It, he couldn't, he, he'd never experienced anything like failure. He had been trained by his mother to believe that he had to be perfect in everything. And the idea that anybody would not want him on a company that he'd given his heart and soul to um, really shattered him. And I also think he felt he didn't have any safety net. And he began to doubt his own strength, his own confidence. Um, I say in the book that that we all have to see ourselves as fathers, even if it's not biological father. But you have to find a father and you have to be a father, even if it's not your biological child. You need to be a teacher and have a teacher. You need to be a warrior and be in the company of warriors. Um, and I believe my father lost his warrior spirit uh, for a time. And as you say, it, it was it was devastating to him and devastating to us to see our father, who, who was always so confident, always knew what to do, and to see him have a nervous breakdown. What it also did for me, Brett, was it when when the time came when I thought this was about to happen to me, when I felt my own um, confidence and my own nerves and even my own body rebelling, when I felt so um, desperate that uh, my, my career seemed to be unraveling and I had always used work as my weapon, uh, determination. Uh, when I started my career, I said to myself, I can't guarantee that I have the talent to make it, but what will never stop me will be a fear of failure or a lack of trying. And, uh, and I found a time in my life when I was afraid and, and couldn't even seem to get myself um, out of this cramp of, of emotion and um, and my I remembered my father and the way he had he had hit the bottom and then he had worked his way back to the top and a top much higher than he'd ever thought and that's what happened with me I I, I got down on my knees and prayed sincerely if I go down in this fight let me go down with my flag flying not worshiping a false idol of what Hollywood says we should go after and be. Uh, let, me, let me write the kind of story that is me, that gives me goosebumps, that m brings tears to my eyes or, or makes me laugh out loud. I will do that and I'll take whatever the result is. And had it not been for my father showing me the way a man is, my father couldn't teach me to write but he could show me what a man was. That's what a father is. Yeah, I love that. And, and you call those moments uh, brave heart moments, right? Those moments where you have to dig deep and really, you know, find out, you know, what you really believe in, and then go for that. Yes, exactly. You've got to find out. You sometimes you want to say, well, "I want to follow my beliefs," but there are times come when you go, "I'm not sure what I believe." Yeah, so you're right. That's part of a brave heart moment. Yeah. Um, so besides fathers, um, friends and brothers and sisters plays a, a big role in living the Braveheart life. And 
you uh, you talked about one of your friends in particular that I wanted to meet the guy after I read about him. It's uh, Bob from Afghanistan. Can you tell us a little bit about Bob and how he helped you maybe uncover Braveheart or the Braveheart life in your in yourself? Yes, I met this guy um, through a, a, a funny uh, circumstance that I describe in the book. Um, when I met him, I th- I thought he was exactly the kind of guy that I would hate. Um, he he's from Afghanistan. I I he looked like, as I say in the book, he looked kind of like a a, a Middle Eastern lounge lizard to me. Except that he was so strong, and there was something different. And when I say a lounge lizard, I mean that he was wearing like Gucci clothes and Armani suits. And you know, when I was in shorts and a t-shirt, and um, uh, I and he was just so elegant, and I was so uh, rough and country. So I just thought, here's a guy I'll have nothing in common with. But I sat down across. From him the first time we ever spoke and I liked him instantly he had first of all a huge manhood about him he was he was strong and tough and the kind of strength that makes a man look you right in the eye without without a kind of challenge just with a complete confidence in who he is and um just this great quick laugh of poetry in his soul. And he turned out to be from Afghanistan. Now I met him years and years before Afghanistan became to us what it is today of a, a place where, where we were bogged down in, in war. He, his, his father um, was the head man of the Helmand province which is today, and it was then the way it is today, this um, uh, hotbed of of rebels and independence. Uh, Brett, I'm, there's a garbage truck outside, and I'm going to pause for just okay, a second. Sure. Shut the door. Sorry, no. You're fine. I don't want to ruin the sound. <laughs> Knowing that you can edit. Yep, we're good. Um, so Bob from Afghanistan came, Bob from Afghanistan is the son of a man who was the, the chief, the head man, the godfather, if you will, of the entire Helmand province. And the, his mother was part of the royal family of Afghanistan. And uh, he had this incredibly um, rich background in Afghanistan, but he had come to America with a few hundred dollars in his pocket, knowing only a couple of words of English. Um, He worked three or four jobs. He was educated, um, his formal education here at a community college, and he became a spectacularly successful businessman. Um, But what he taught me was that here he was from the other side of the world, from a culture radically different from mine. Um, I grew up in a Christian family. He grew up with a mother who prayed multiple times a day, and his father was head of this entire Muslim culture. Um, he does not himself uh, practice Islam, and he and I have talked a great deal about my faith, um, but I must say I respect I, I respect his no matter what the label is that he puts on it. Um, but I found that we were brothers, that we were, um, we love the same things, um, and that all of the work and struggle that he has gone through in his life, um, where his, all of his brothers, except one, have died. Um, in many ways in the fight for independence uh, for Afghanistan um, when the Russians were there and in, in various other struggles. Um, and all, the, all the, the hard battles that he has fought in his life have not 
taken his spirit. In fact, he viewed them, I think, as um, a chance to be what he is supposed to be. Those are the battles that a man must fight. So he is a man, and there are his battles, and he fights them. Um, and he, he grieves deeply uh, when he loses someone he loves. And I've seen that happen. I saw him when he, he lost one of his brothers. Um, but he, he overcomes that. He, he is a man in full. And the idea that here he is so different from me, and yet we have this brotherhood in common, um, is one of the, the clearest examples to me of, of what it means to have a brother and how important it is, what a rich treasure it, it is. Um, I was once asked a question about um, why I make movies about honor and, and courage and sacrifice. It was a, a Japanese writer who asked me, and um, I'd never been asked a question like that. It was a, around my first movie, Man in the Iron Mask, and I said, well, I suppose it's because the second greatest wealth any man can have in life is to have someone in his life who would die for him. But the greatest wealth you can have is someone in your life you would die for. And this Japanese writer said, <laughs> and, uh, and the translator translated it. Um, he says, that you're a samurai, and when you come to Tokyo, he wants to get drunk with you. Um, and I think that a man in Japan, a man in Afghanistan, and a man in America, we're all men. And when when a man is a man, uh, when a man has that has that attitude of there's something greater than my own physical survival. Uh, then you have a brotherhood and you found somebody that will inspire you. And that's what Bob does for me. Yeah, that's amazing. Um, and I think you're right. I think across cultures, men understand that. They understand when, when someone says you need to be a man, some people will, will inevitably fall on the sort of the tropes of masculinity that, you know, the sort of shallow ones. But I think most men <laughs> deep down know, no, it means you got to be brave. You got to have a sense of honor. You got to have a sense of, uh, love, like a deep, like uh, what would you call it? fraternity or brotherhood? Um, and I, yeah, I think your movies do hit on that big time. Brett, what you just said, you know, when we hear in our current culture, you've got to be a man, what that often connotes is the opposite of what being a man is. Being a man, when, when that's said, I thought it means you're supposed to ignore pain. You're supposed to mask off your emotions. You're supposed to stop being honest. Um, now, of course, there are times when we say, I've got to man up here, meaning I've got to overcome these things. But it doesn't mean let's ignore them. Let's pretend that we don't have them. Um, and those men across cultures, I think, what you're describing here is we're recognizing in each other that the cost of, um, of caring, of loving, of having loyalty and honor, there is a cost. And you see in the other man, this is a guy who pays that bill. And that's a man that I want to be like. Yeah. Um, so one of the things I love about Braveheart I think a lot of men love about it is that it is like some people call it the manliest chick flick ever made. Um, because in the end, the, the, the movie is about love. It's about the love of family, the love of country, the love of people, the love of freedom. And it seems like Braveheart is the very, the great encapsulation of this idea that to be a man is to both cultivate hard and soft virtues. Um, how do you think men and there are not talking about military guys, just everyday guys can cultivate those sort of brave heart virtues that are both hard and soft? Wow. That's such a great question. And I, I think that um, on a practical level, it's that we need to be in relationship with each other, with other men and we need to, to have relationships with women. That 
you know, I say in, in the book that um, a man who does not honor women can never live a brave heart life. It doesn't mean we have to agree with them or do what women seem to try to get us to do. And look, I, um, I, can't, I can't claim, I've been divorced for 15 years, I can't claim that I'm an expert in, in uh, male-female relationships. But I do believe that women will, on the surface, be trying to get us to stop being men and yet the last thing they want us to do is to stop being men. <laughs> uh, they, they desperately need us to be men just as we need them to be women. And there, there are differences. Thank God. I mean, God made them different, made us different. And, um, uh, and for us to revel in those differences is, is part of the, the beauty of life. Um, I think that to be a brave heart man means that you you face fears rather than run from them. That's one of the first things you cannot. I mean, bravery means um, uh, being yourself in the face of danger or fear. Uh, sometimes the danger isn't nearly as great as the fear is, and the only way we can find that out is by looking the fear in the face. Um, I, I had a period in my life, um, and I still, of course, have it from time to time, but um, it was around the time of my divorce when I would get out of bed in the morning and get on my knees and pray with all my heart for the strength to have to get through the day with courage and, um, and not, be, not be dragged down in despair. And that night when I would start to crawl back into bed, I'd get down on my knees again to say, thank you, I got through this day. And, and I realized I did have courage in that day. And the only way you can have courage is if there's something in your life that, that is dangerous to you. We want to have the opportunity to be courageous. And the only way we can do that is by stepping forward into um, the arena where something is at risk, our ego, our finances, uh, our physical um, comfort. Uh, but that is the only place where courage is required. And, and a brave heart feeds off of courage and courage uh, only exists in the presence of fear. So fear isn't a bad thing. It's just a factor. Um, it's a reality of, um, of that dynamic of, of the presence of courage. So it seems like, I just from our talking, that faith is a really big thing in your life, an important thing. And when I was thinking about it last night, uh, about Braveheart, it is in a way, not only a story of love, there, it is a story of faith in a lot of ways that William Wallace had this belief in Scotland that he couldn't see, but he believed in it and he, he thought it was true and he did all he could to make it work. So in a way it is, a, it is a story of faith. So I'm curious, what role does faith fit into living the Braveheart life? Brad, I, I believe that these words that we use, faith, courage, love, hope, are in many ways the same thing. Yeah. I, know, I know we use them in different contexts and, and they have different connotations to us, but they all mean the same thing, that William Wallace... La, the, at least the William Wallace that I wrote. Uh, I, I have to, you know, I, <laughs> I tell the story in the book that like on the wall of the Air Force Academy are the words, they may take our lives, but they'll never take our freedom. And the attribution under them is William Wallace. Well, William Wallace didn't say that. I did. <laughs> <laughs> but he said it now. William Wallace said it now. <laughs> That's right. It's my ego talk. Yeah. But the William Wallace that, that I wrote um, 
loved his country so much, and I believe the real one too, by the way, that, that he loved his country so much that he thought the only way I can help Scotland be free, I can contribute that, I can, I can allow that dream to, to still breathe, is if I am willing to put myself in the hands of people who have already betrayed me. Um, and this, of course, the, does not come from my reading the Encyclopedia Britannica about William Wallace. It comes from my reading the New Testament about Jesus of Nazareth. Uh, that, that, is the, that is the story that that comes from. But, my, um, but I don't wrap my understanding in a given doctrine or, or terms. Um, when people will ask me about, uh, you know, say, well, can an atheist go to heaven? Or, um, you know, I have these wonderful discussions with various friends of mine, uh, great writers who are um, even greater friends. And, um, and some of them call themselves atheists or agnostics or various other forms of religion. And, and I always tell them, look, there's a, a passage in the Bible, uh, something Jesus said, and I feel absolutely certain that he said it very much exactly as we have it in the Bible. He's, he tells a parable of a, a father says to his two sons, go to work in my field. And one son says, I will, and he doesn't. And the other son says, I won't, and he does. And Jesus says to the people he's teaching, so which one did the will of his father? And I take that in terms of the labels we use for ourselves when we talk about faith. Um, you know, there are people that say, I'm a believer, but you say, well, do you do the will of God? And there are other people who say, I don't believe in any of that. But you look in their lives and you think they manifest love and faith and courage. And, and I say to myself, I don't judge. I, I thank heaven. I'm not the person who decides um, where, whether somebody is in heaven or not. And, uh, and I, I do believe that heaven is here. Um, and I think, you know, Jesus taught heaven is all around us. But I try not ever to get wrapped up in arguing about labels. I get wrapped up in, are we doing the will of the spirit that made us, that made the universe? The, what, what made the stars made us. And, um, and I believe we're made for a purpose. Uh, and I believe that purpose is love. And I believe that, that courage is one of the manifestations of that. So <laughs> that's all, yeah. that's my understanding of the moment. Sure. And when you bring that, like following that will, right? However you want to describe it, that can be a very scary thing, right? Like you, you get this thing, like you, you, you get this feeling or this compulsion, like this is what I need to do. But then all around you, you have these, well, no, if I do that, that I might lose my job. Uh, my yes. friends might laugh at me. Yes. It's, 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 it can be terrifying at times. Yes. And I, I very early on, um, uh, very early on, I made the linkage of if I try something bold, daring, even reckless, uh, I will feel better about the result than if I never attempt something like that. I like myself better and I feel more myself when I'm doing something crazy, like I'll write a screenplay. I'll write a novel, I'll write a song. I believe that writing is an act of faith, is an act of courage. Um, I believe what you do is exactly the same. I, whenever you speak, the very notion that you have something to contribute um, is certainly an act of courage. Listening is too, of course. Um, but uh, I think the very fact that we are on this planet, we find ourselves uh, as boys or girls 
when we become aware, okay, I'm here. I came from someplace. Uh, when I, I describe this in the book that I, I watched a son being born. I've seen all my sons be born. And shortly after one of them was born, I watched my mother breathe her last breath. And you look at a, a child coming into the world and I cannot witness that without feeling I have just witnessed an overwhelming miracle. Um, and when I see someone that I love as dearly as we love our mothers, breathe her last breaths, and I look at what was once her body, and now it looks like a husk. I understand why human beings have always grappled with this and had a sense of soul or spirit of look for a word because she was no longer there. Um, and um, we, whenever we have that experience, when we find ourselves saying, okay, I am here, I am in this world. I don't know where I came from. I'm not sure what's on the other side of this life, but why am I here? And you're either gonna behave as if that was a random accident or you're gonna behave as if it's a gift then, and you are given it for some reason and it's not yours forever. And that's why I believe Every man dies, but not every man really lives. And our whole purpose is to find the way to be really alive. But we're going to end on that because um, that's a great way to end. Randall Wallace, thank you so much for your time. This has been an absolute pleasure. Brad, thank you so much. Can't wait to do it again. And I will anytime with you, buddy. This is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. My guest today is Randall Wallace. He's the author of the book, Living the Braveheart Life, Finding the Courage to Follow Your Heart. It's available on Amazon.com and bookstores everywhere. Go out and get it. It's a really great read.